go ahead and turn off your mic. Um, that will help us uh, prevent any feedback from happening throughout uh, our program. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you today. Um, I am Jennifer Rostari Dickinson, and I am the Director of Education here at the Stark Museum of Art. And um, we are thrilled to have you here joining us for our Lunch and Look at Home, uh, Connoisseurship, Good, Better, and Best. Um, today, we are thrilled to be partnering with the Cal Sharp Historic Site and Bonhams to offer this program. Um, and just a few things to tell you about today's program. Um, we uh, will have a special presentation from Katherine Halligan, the Western Art Specialist at Bonhams. She's going to present for about 30 minutes. And then we'll have a question and answer session. And we are thrilled to have Davison Koning here with us from the Cal Sharp Historic Site, as well as our curator here at the Stark Museum of Art, Sarah Bain, um, to answer any questions that you might have. And then we'll be wrapping up roughly around about an hour. So we have a great, um, great opportunity and program for you to get going. Um, I will be monitoring the chat throughout this program. If you have questions, please put those in the chat box or you can save it till the end and we'll turn on our mics to ask questions. Um, I think that that is it, Davis. Um, and I, I guess let me just real quick introduce everyone. Davis and Coning, if you want to give us a wave here, just so everyone can see you. Davis and Coning from the Cal Sharp Historic Site. Um, and also Lindsay Davis from Bonhams. And you are out of Houston. Lindsay's our representative out of Houston. And I'm going to turn it over to Lindsay to introduce um, our speaker, Catherine Halligan. Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. As she said, I'm Lindsay Davis. I'm the regional representative for Bonhams working in Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. And I'm based here in Houston. And we also have another office in Dallas, Texas. And I wanted to thank my, my colleague, Terry Hardy, who's in our Scottsdale office for helping us invite some people and pull this together. So I'm here to introduce Catherine Halligan, who will be leading us in this fun and fascinating lecture. Catherine is our Western art specialist here at Bonhams and she is based in our LA office. Katie led the first standalone Western art auction for Bonhams, whereas previous Western art auctions were part of our California and Western art auctions. And this uh, category proved to be so successful that we decided to pull together single sales for just Western art. And Katie brings over 20 years of experience in the field of historic and contemporary Western fine art sales. Katie has worked for international and regional auction houses and has worked with the estates of artists, including Conrad Buff. Catherine received her bachelor's in art degree in art history from Wells College Aurora, New York, and she is a certified appraiser with the Appraisers Association of America. So with that, I'll hand it over to Catherine Halligan. Thank you so much. Thanks for that introduction, Lindsay. And I want to say thank you to you. This was Lindsay's idea in the first place to pursue these virtual lectures, and she's been facilitating the bottom end of things from day one. So thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to be here. It's a huge honor with our incredible co-hosts, um, who are really the starting point when we're talking about conversation and an appreciation for exceptional Western fine art. Uh, the Cow Sharp Historic Site in Taos is such a unique location where you can really kind of delve into the process and get a sense of the feeling of what it would have been like to be back in the day um, watching them work. So you can see Kaus and Sharp's uh, historic studios stand at Kaus's easel, which I can't wait to do myself, but also um, get into the, the um, details of how their, their process was, looking at the photographs they were taking as preliminary materials, um, seeing their sketchbooks, looking at their incredible library. So it's a great resource uh, from a collecting standpoint to really get to know the context that the artists were working in. And then of course, our other co-host, the unrivaled collection of the Sharp Museum of Art in Orange, where you can see and uh, develop your eye using seeing the A plus best, best, best examples of the Tao Society of Founders, as well as the 19th century frontier artists like Catlin and, and Miller, and as well as the the big guys, uh, Frederick Remington and Charles Marion Russell. Plus they round out their collections and give you some beautiful context with Native American holdings, decorative arts, and of course they're uh, really wonderful books and manuscripts as well. So that's really you know, the starting point for talking about connoisseurship is using institutions like our co-host today to really get a good sense of the exceptional best works by an artist and also who they were as people and as practitioners of their work. 
But delving deep into an artist's life, uh, supporting wonderful institutions, it's all as you're gaining knowledge, but at the end of the day, you can't take it home with you. <laughs> so that's where I'm talking today. So pivoting to a, if you're actually going to become a collector or continue collecting, pivoting to private dealers, galleries, um, online marketplaces, and then of course, traditional auction houses like Bonhams is the way to really continue your collecting journey. Um, so today I'll explore four different case studies of Western American artists that are not in the institutions that we're talking about today, <clears throat> using real life examples from the auction world. I'll discuss how to discern something that might be a good example versus a better example versus a best example. And then we'll also talk about considerations regarding condition, uh, medium, subject, uh, period painted, things to look out for, um, things to just uh, kind of um, increase your knowledge base on, and perhaps some things to avoid or at least go in very informed. As Lindsay mentioned, I've been in the auction world or worked as a certified appraiser since 1999. And I've always been in the American art realm, specifically with the Western collecting areas of historic and contemporary Western art and California Impressionism and Modernism. So the information I'm sharing today is really things that I've gleaned through my career, buying and selling, um, appraising, advising uh, as well. But I have to start with a little caveat, a little cheat. Um, if I happen to identify something as good versus great, or perhaps a red flag, it doesn't categorically mean that you should avoid it. My point is that you should just go into the transaction informed, have a good sense of the realistic value of something, also have a sense of whether something might be on the decorative side that just adorns your home and gives you enjoyment, but something else that might be more of a potential investment, um, you know, wealth building thing that might increase value over time. And, you know, there's many important distinctions that we'll get into there. But at the end of the day, um, buy what you love. That's the best piece of advice I can always give you. Uh, it's your life, it's your home. And even if it's a reproduction and you love it, great. It's giving you enjoyment and that's the most important thing. So before I begin my slideshow, one small piece of housekeeping. I'm, I'm gonna be talking about the auction world um, and primarily auction uh, prices are reported including premium. So you have the fall of the hammer and that's what a seller is looking at. So that's you know, the, that's the price it sold for at the fall of the hammer and then their fees are deducted. And then the auction houses also take a commission on the buyer side. So because the buyer is paying that hammer plus premium, reporting is usually including the full price that they paid. So I think I have one piece perhaps that is um, hammer price, but everything else I'll be mentioning includes buyer's premium. So let me start sharing my screen. seeing that now? Can you see that everybody? Not yet, let's see. Oh, let me try that again, sorry. How about now? Yes. Okay, great. So here's obviously our introduction. But we're going to begin um, my first case study talking about artist Edgar Elwin King, who is most strongly associated with the California movement, uh, the plein air movement, um, particularly if you think about his uh, California landscapes and seascapes, and especially his Sierra Mountain scenes. In fact, there's a lake named uh, for him because he spent so much time in that region, Payne Lake. But starting in 1916, he made trips to the Navajo lands in Arizona and New Mexico. And you'll see here a photograph of the artist um, standing before a Canyon de Chez paint, uh, painting in his studio. This was the only uh, photo I could find of Payne in front of a Western landscape. And it's taken from Dr. Shields' excellent um, Edgar Payne book, The Scenic Journey. Payne was largely self-taught. Uh, he was a Chicago-based artist and spent a, a brief, apparently unhappy time formally at the Art Institute of Chicago, but primarily self-taught. And he was a successful mural and uh, painter in Chicago and was a member of the important clubs at the time. That was a, a very important area in American art. So he was a, a Chicago Society of Artists member as well as a Paladin Chisel Club, club member. But he had a, a very strong desire to experience new subjects, um, have new, new um, landscapes to, to explore. In fact, his wife described his insatiable desire for seeing new almost as if it was a muse to him. And so that was, of course, the artist Elsie Palmer Payne. 
While Payne's contemporaries from Chicago, namely Walter Ufer, uh, Victor Higgins, and Ernest Martin Hennings, I'm sure names we're all very familiar with, they all focused on the Taos area and ultimately became Taos Society of Artists founding members, but Payne did not follow suit. Partly due to perhaps some ego that he uh, kind of uh, fancied himself as an adventurer, and there were a lot of artists working, in, as Davidson can attest to, in Taos in 1916. So he felt, although there were artists also in Arizona, New Mexico, Canyon de Chez, Marnie in the Valley area, there were a lot less, and he felt this was a more perhaps adventurous area to go to. I think he also, and you'll see in his, his following slides, uh, appreciated the bigness, the vastness of this area. And most importantly, uh, there was a financial consideration. The Santa Fe Railroad gave him a commission in 1916 to come to this area. So that's really why he's come for the first time in 1916. We know he painted about 11 finished oil paintings and an unknown number of drawings in the few months he first visited Canyon de Chez. Um, and he didn't, did not return again to that area until 1930, but at that point he's coming every year until he's unable to travel again in about 1945, and he's dying in 1947, as you can see here. So he almost never dates his works. I, I flipped too fast, but he almost never dates his works, but you, you'll be able to see most of what I'm showing you most likely dates from the later 1930s, early 40s period. They tend to have a, a largeness to them, a vastness to them, a bolder palette, bolder brush strokes. Um, and of course, he did not visit Monument Valley in 1916, so you wouldn't see a Monument Valley scene from that period. So those would definitely date uh, post 1930. Can, Canyon de Chez and Monument Valley are always great subjects for the artist. Um, bonus if he includes figures in them, and an extra bonus if the figures are well uh, executed and grounded in the scene. You'll see in most of these scenes, the, the landscape is certainly the dominant force, but um, we also have some wonderful examples of landscapes, I'm sorry, of figures. <clears throat> so in this slide, we have four works on paper, all featuring Canyon de Chez and Monument Valley subjects. They all have uh, their graphite or pencil based. Uh, the upper left also includes some watercolor washes, as you can see with the color, and the upper right is a charcoal graphite combination. Three of the four include figures in them, obviously different levels of prominence. And uh, I've included the lower right piece for the obvious condition issue. So that's my first kind of conversation. With works on paper, condition is particularly important and you really need to go into a potential purchasing transaction knowing exactly what you're getting into. So questions to ask yourself, is the paper loose? Um, is it taped to a mat? Is that tape archival? The paper isn't going to be archival from this period, but is are the materials that surrounding it archival? Is it laid down or affixed to a board? Um, is that board it removable? Uh, is the board archival? And then with the paper, are there creases, handling cre uh, creases, tears, uh, nibbles to the edges, staining like you can see in the lower right, or foxing, meaning mold spores on the surface? So you can see in that lower right piece, um, this is an older example, but it had the most obvious condition issue for this context, so I included it. It's from a 2006 sale. Um, but you can see that really dominant ink stain in the lower left portion of it. So I think it's quite detracting from the scene. Uh, so I would hope that a paper restorer would be able to reduce the intensity of this, uh, of this stain or even um, remove it altogether. But I, my point is just have that conversation before you purchase it and find out really what, what you're getting into. In terms of pricing, these Navajo land scenes, um, I, I works on paper by Payne, they tend to sell in today's auction market in the low to mid thousands. So the top three, oh, sorry, the top two and the lower left all sold in the last year or so between three and four thousand dollars. And then the, interestingly enough, um, because that 2006 period, pre-recession period was so strong, the riders in Monument Valley with the stain still brought almost $2,000. Um, but I don't think it would bring that much in today's market. This next slide includes three examples of really beautiful mid-sized canvases from the same locations that we're talking about by Payne. Um, they're all really well painted with competent brush strokes, um, mature brushwork, bold palette. Um, definitely the sense of bigness is captured in all of them. The uh, Red Mesa and Thunderheads and Red Bluff and Thunderheads were both offered at Bottoms last year and they each brought about $12,000. And the Canyon de Chez, which I think is the superior piece on this page of the three, was at um, a bottom sale in 2016 and brought $40,000 against an estimate of 25 to 35. 
And I have, I suspect that that one just based on the brushwork may be from the early period. Now getting into pieces that include riders, we're building upward in terms of heading toward best here. So there's two mid-sized Canyon Duché landscapes in front of us, um, both featuring riders. Uh, I think the riders do a great job of kind of grounding the scene and, and um, enhancing the sense of, of expansiveness. Uh, but in, I, I'm using pieces pulled off the internet, so I apologize for the pixelation, but I've kind of pulled out the riders to, de to do details of them. And you can see, and particularly in the piece on the right, the legs of the horses are quite spindly and they're just really one small stroke of paint. So they're kind of, when you zoom in, despite the shadow beneath them, they are kind of floating in the scene. The left painting sold at Coeur d'Alene in 2018 for about 55,000 and the right painting sold at Bonhams um, last year for about 26,000. Uh, so they're both still really desirable, but you're, as we build here, you'll see that there are different differentiation in the articulation of three dimensionality and the grounding of his riders. In this scene, uh, again, you can see the you know, huge, huge rock faces. It's really incredible. Um, and then you have your, your uh, figural grouping in the lower center. Large canvas, really nicely articulated figures. Um, you can see they're much more complicated, even though my um, blow up is very pixelated, but you can see that there, there are more colors being utilized. There's just more brush strokes being utilized to create those figures. And they're certainly more grounded in the scene. This sold for about $188,000 at auction in 2016. And then we have another piece. Sorry, I skipped myself. This sold for $80,000. This one sold for $187,000. So again, uh, you're getting building again. It's a larger canvas. It's 28 by 34. You have a really beautiful figural group of four this time. And I think that they're very well grounded and um, well articulated as well. So this one sold in 2016 for $187,000. So it's not a coincidence that I, I chose this particular image for our invitation. Um, I think it really has all the elements you'd want in an Edgar Payne from this period and from the subject. The vastness of the landscape, the beautiful sunlit shadow, air, sunlight and shadow areas of the scene, um, thick bold brushwork, three riders coming toward us right at the front center, um, well-defined three-dimensionality to the figures. They're really nicely grounded in the scene. And it's just overall a beautiful sunlit scene. This uh, sold at auction at Bottoms in 2016. It's the top price for an, an Arizona subject uh, since 2008, which was a height of the market that we haven't seen again. And it sold for $323,000 with that buyer's premium. So I'll leave the pain discussion with this last image. Um, these types of rare compositions where the figures take center stage are really special, I think. Um, it's known that pain utilized both photography and also large scale sketches. Um, and there, there are historic examples of his uh, photographs of the Navajo peoples. And so I would say in works like this, he's definitely back in the studio utilizing the, the photography and the sketches like so many other artists did. And it really lends an immediacy to the scene and also the historical accuracy. It was a Navajo custom that if a, a man died in his Hogan, the Hogan would become um, his, he would be cremated there. And that's what we're seeing here. So the burning, it's called burning the Hogan. And you see that, poignant column of smoke in the right center um, coming up uh, from the landscape. And then you have, of course, the, the vignette of the three uh, prominent riders in the left center uh, looking back. Uh, so they're presumably family or friends and they're saying their last goodbyes to the, the person who's passed away. This is a particularly strong narrative for pain. As you saw in the other ones, they're a little bit more straightforward, but this one tells a much more poignant story and consequently value-wise, these, these type of pieces are, are um, on the upper end of pain's work. This sold in 2019 at Coeur d'Alene for uh, about $270,000 with premium. And it was just offered again and sold at Scottsdale Art Auction this past weekend and still brought $250,000 hammer. They hadn't reported with premium yet. So with premium, I'm sure it'll exceed the 2019 record, but it's interesting um, offering them just a year or so apart and they're still, it's still commanding the same amount of money. So uh, you know, sometimes when you're reoffering an auction, you see a deduction in value, but in this case, it's holding its value because I think it's such a special piece. Moving on to case study number two, a, a woman historic artist called Catherine Woodman Layton. 
Um, you see here a really sweet self-portrait that um, I offered, it did not sell, I have to admit, but I offered in a former, um, at, when I was at John Moran Auctioneers as part of, uh, it came from her family collection and I, it's just a very striking self-portrait, but um, I guess it wasn't appealing to everybody. And then you have a photograph of the artist as well. She's an artist I quite like because, you know, she was a woman working in a man's world um, and she was quite progressive in her personal relationship at the time. She's known primarily for uh, fairly sensitive uh, depictions of portraits of Native American peoples, primarily the Blackfeet people. Um, so she grew up in New Hampshire, educated in Massachusetts, and she marries Edward Layton, a lawyer in Massachusetts in 1900. And uh, they had a very progressive relationship. He was very supportive financially and emotionally of Catherine's work and accompanied her when he could on painting expeditions. So they had you know, quite a progressive and modern um, marriage for the time. In 1910, they moved to Los Angeles and Catherine continued studying under Jean Mannheim, the art at landscape artist at the Stickney School in Pasadena. Um, she also was quite an active member of the Los Angeles art scene at the time. And she, we know she's painting uh, Native American subjects by about 1918. Interestingly, um, which I love, although I've never experienced this myself, um, if you read about her, supposedly she actually had some of her sitters sign alongside her so she would sign and the sitter would sign, which I think is just such a remarkably modern and, um, and respectful way to go. But I've handled a lot of her works and I've never seen that, but I think that would be a huge bonus if, if you ever uh, saw a Leighton that had the signature as with, with the sitter. Through um, Jack Wilkinson Smith, Leighton met Charlie Russell and he facilitated introductions to her um, with officials at the Northern Pacific Railway. And he also introduced her to the Blackfeet um, elders. So uh, that's happening in 1926. Uh, after the introductions from Charlie Russell, she receives a commission to go to Glacier National Park to paint uh, the Blackfeet Indians. And she and her family live there for a couple of months. And she produces about 20 significant um, oils, primarily of the Blackfeet chiefs uh, who were paid by the railway for their time. And it was a very happy situation. Um, the, the tribe uh, adopted her and gave her a name, Anna Tarki, which uh, translates to beautiful woman in spirit. And it also certainly launched Catherine Layton's career. So she uh, kind of continues focusing on Native American subject matter uh, going forward and paints a variety of, of uh, different peoples, including the Iroquois, the Sioux, Cherokee, Osage, Navajo, Pawnee. So she's making like annual trips to different, um, different tribal areas and, um, and painting people there. So you mostly do see uh, portraits of Native Americans. She also produced still life. she made landscapes of Glacier National Park. But um, in the case of our uh, talk today, I'm just going to be focusing on her Native American portraiture, which as is estimated to, uh, she is estimated to have painted about 700 portraits, which is quite prolific. So here in this first slide, we see what I would consider better examples. Um, they're all uh, unidentified figures. Uh, they're all smaller in size and they're kind of just straightforward uh, chest up portrait pieces. So we don't know the sitter. And with Leighton, we're looking at a known sitter, details of dress and ornamentation, or the general compositions appealing. So these, again, are kind of more mundane examples of her work. Um, in, in the cases of all three, they were multiply offered at auctions in the last couple of years. So the prices I'll, I'll give you now are like the second, third, fourth time they've been up at auction. So again, thinking in, in terms of auction, those, these would not be considered quote unquote fresh because they've been up for a few times before. So Young American on our left sold for $500, Young Warrior in the center about 700, and then um, the piece titled Indian with Turquoise Earrings, uh, because it is much more detailed and a little bit more of an interesting um, individualized portrait, sold for about $2,800. Moving on to what I would think are better examples for Leighton. Here we have again, um, two beautiful portraits, but not identified um, as individual sitters. Uh, but you can see more subtle brushwork on these pieces, uh, more interesting detail of their dress and ornamentation. And I quite like the dramatic black background. These were both offered at Hinman auction last June. Um, I would assume from the same collector since they're so similar. And they both brought about $12,000 with premium, uh, estimated uh, the left portrait at three to five, the right portrait at four to six. So they far exceeded their fairly conservative estimates. Moving on to a couple of things that I think for Catherine Layton are best examples. Two of the three are known sitters. And here, first, we have uh, Chief White Dog of the Blackfeet tribe. 
So you can see I included a, an Albert type or a Kala type uh, portrait that I uh, pulled offline, uh, online um, by William Bowles. You can see an actual photograph of the sitter to see that Leighton is fairly true to, to, to his actual um, identity. Great details in the scene. He's wearing a beautiful Pendleton uh, blanket jacket, sitting against a willow rod teepee um, backrest and tripod. The teepee is de beautifully decorated. He's holding an arrow. Um, you can see that he's sitting on a buffalo hide rug. And you can even see that he's wearing the same rings in the Albert type as he is in Leighton's uh, portrait, which I thought was kind of charming. This piece was offered a few years ago at Bonham's and brought about $20,000. The next piece is also an identified um, chief, uh, Blackfeet chief called Lazy Boy. And I also included a photograph I found of him. So you can see it's not quite as, pro, it's three quarter profile, but you can see that there's a, you know, a, it's certainly a strong resemblance to her portrait. This piece also has great details. Um, Lazy Boy holds the horse hair fly whisk. He has a whistle in his mouth and you'll see, if you, if you Google him, you'll see that whistle motif in uh, other depictions of, of the man. Um, there's you know, be beautiful feather decoration. Uh, I love his bold yellow shirt. And it also has a finished background and a pleasant setting. So this piece, um, and of course, a really nice profile. This piece hammered around the high end of um, the estimate when it was offered at Hinman in 2019 uh, for 28,000, almost $29,000. And that is her top price at auction in the current market, like the post 2008 recession market. And finally for Leighton, um, another piece unidentified, but I just love this painting. It's a showstopper of details, I think. Um, so it's not identified sitter, but uh, bear claw necklace, um, bowl, the bow and chest plate, he's holding a, a pipe. And then of course you have this outrageous bonnet and a gorgeous setting that he's in. Interestingly in a Western chair, but otherwise some beautiful um, motifs uh, from the Blackfeet people and a, and a particularly fierce and dramatic profile. This one sold at John Moran in 2018 for about 22,500. So moving on to case study number three, uh, moving on to a bronze sculptor, just changing up the medium here. Cyrus Dallin was a turn of the 19th to 20th century sculptor who was also politically active in his support of the rights of Native Americans. So of certainly of the time, I don't mean to overstate that, but he was quite progressive for the period. He was politically active in his adopted state of Massachusetts as well on the national level. Um, he specifically worked to identify uh, real issues affecting Native American peoples in this country and helped uh, create advocacy groups, some of which ultimately morphed into the Association of, the Ameri of American Indian Affairs. And he, although he's kind of best known for his heroic depictions of Native Americans, he did do other subjects, but today we'll just talk about his Native American, one particular series of Native American subjects that he did. He certainly uh, attempted, uh, I don't think it's perfect, but he attempted to not idealize and really try, try to capture um, authentic details of, in his works. And um, he also always had this sense in his mind of kind of being in their shoes and his work sort of underscoring the idea that he's uh, identifying deceitful and inhumane practices, treatment and practices of Indians of, of, in the United States of America and the government. So he really is quite political in his work. His interest in Native American subject matter started um, as a child. He grew up in the rural Mormon settlement of Springville, Utah. And um, so he was directly in contact, regular um, trading contact and casual contact through um, in, in the childhood friendships and that sort of thing with the local Paiute and Ute Indians. And in fact, he started even uh, sculpting in the clay beds with his uh, Paiute and Ute uh, boyfriends when he was a child, creating um, three-dimensional uh, figurines and, and playing the, the clay in different sort of games. And of course, so he's uh, identified as having some talent, gets a, uh, gets a scholarship to go to work in Boston, to, to intern in Boston under another um, sculptor, and he's successful in Boston, and then stays there, opens his own studio, and he's taking portrait commissions. Um, he goes to uh, Paris to continue studies in the late 1880s, and he uh, is studying at the Academy Julian there. In, in, in the 1880s, he's conceiving in Paris of this ambitious series of four life-size equestrian uh, protest sculptures. And we'll see here the series that the epic of the Indian, 
um, that visually would illustrate in his mind the story of the problematic relationship between the Native American peoples and the white man. He actually started making preliminary drawings in Paris. Um, the wild, uh, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show was on an extended seven month run. And uh, there were Lakota peoples who were performers in the show and he befriended them and they actually served as his preliminary sketches as he's conceiving of this idea while studying in Paris. The first of the series, which was cast in Paris in 1890 is the signal of peace you see in the upper left. Uh, this tells the story, uh, these are all Sioux figures and it tells the story of a Sioux chief ready to offer friendship and goodwill. Uh, there is a life-size bronze of this work at Lincoln Park in Chicago. And then Gorham casts, in all, case, all four cases, Gorham is casting statuettes, uh, like tabletop size sculptures of these pieces as well. So there's a 30 inch high version and a 14 inch high version that includes the spear. So to the top of the figure's head is eight, eight and a half or, or nine inches tall. Um, the, I don't know the addition for the 30 inch. The highest number I know in the addition is the piece that's depicted here that we offered in our February auction. It's number 70. The next in the series is called The Medicine Man, which was cast in 1899. And that depicts the tribal prophet and protector lifting his right arm in a gesture of warning. So this also was cast in a life-size bronze that is now in the Fairmont Park uh, in Philadelphia. Gorham produced a 16 inch and a 30 inch of this as well. Addition number is unknown. Um, they don't come up so frequently. So uh, the top price at auction from The Medicine Man is about $20,000. And only about a dozen examples have been offered, uh, at least uh, period examples. There's been some recasts. Uh, but period examples have been offered since about the late, uh, late 1980s. The third piece in the series of the epic of the Indian is the protest, lower left. Um, that was cast in 1904. And here you see the enemy is identified. The Indian is angry. He raises a clenched fist against his foe. This was never conceived in a life-size bronze. Um, but it was conceived in staff or plaster of Paris and won the gold medal at the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. But this, that staff model uh, deteriorated quickly and um, is no longer, it, it was you know, kind of destroyed, it just melted, I would imagine. And again, never cast in bronze. <clears throat> there is uh, some Gorm cast, a 20 inch, that's been offered about eight times since 1984. The top price at auction for this cast is 36,000, but that's from a 2006 height of the market. Um, most recently, it was offered in 2012 at Sotheby's at five to 7,000, but went unsold. So you can see the, um, the trends in the market. This is not such a popular one of this series. But what we'll be mostly talking about going forward here is finally the appeal to the great spirit, which was cast in 1907. And here you see the final of the four. The Tsu chief throws his head back and extends his arms upward in a very raw and emotional plea for divine intervention. It's certainly the most iconic and well-known of, of uh, Cyrus Dallin's work. The uh, first life-size cast, or the, the life-size cast of Appeal to the Great Spirit won the gold medal at the Paris Salon in 1909 and currently is in front of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. There's three editions of this one. There's a 36 inch with an unknown edition, 22 inch with about an edition of 107 and a 10 inch with an edition of at least 100, uh, sorry, 280. So I was able to offer um, the lower right piece, which is a 22 inch that you'll see here in a larger format, as well as the, the nine inch version in my sale in February. So I just wanted to talk about comparing the two sizes and, and things to look out for. So we see here in the 22 inch incredible detail. Um, I think even in the slide, you can see that the hands are very well articulated. Um, you know, his headdress and uh, the figure's musculature and the horse's musculature is beautifully, beautifully articulated as well. It's got a gorgeous golden patina. Um, we did have the reins replaced. Um, these reins are removable. There's a, a connection point at the horse's chin and at the base of his mane, and they do come off and they're often lost. So this one, I guess, was the victim of an overzealous uh, house cleaner a few decades ago. So we had the reins remade. Um, so those are those are modern reins, but otherwise it's completely original from from um, its execution point. And it's been in a private collection since the 1940s until it was sold in our past February auction. Here's some other views as well. So you can see in the next scene, uh, this piece has a really deeply incised signature in that upper left, right into the bronze, beautifully done. And then lower left, you have the Gorham founder, boundary mark. You can see in this three squares, that is the code 
uh, the QPN and then the three squares, that's the code for this size of the, the appeal to the great spirit. And then right below that, you see stamped in one, two, and that indicates that this is the 12th edition. So that's the unique number of this edition. This one had an interesting um, issue with it. And you can see that in the right side um, with my, my arrow indicating the, the patch. So during the lost wax casting method at Gorham, um, they had a blowout. And so they repaired the blowout by putting this pat, this bronze patch on. So when we received the sculpture, like I said, it had been in the family since at least the 1940s. And although it's, you know, it's flushed to the, the bronze, it still had a little bit of an edge to it. And there was dust accumulation and debris accumulation along the edge of the patch. So it was pretty obvious. So we had it cleaned and uh, re-waxed. You can clearly still see it, but it's not nearly as obvious when you're looking at the bronze overall. And it was just sort of an interesting, I wouldn't say condition issue, but condition consideration. So because of the replaced reins and because of this blowout patch, we conservatively estimated the piece at 50 to 70,000. And I'm happy to say that it brought about $100,000 despite those issues, um, which is the third highest price for this particular cast at this size, but it's the highest price since 2013. This now is the eight and three quarter inch high bronze. And you can see it's still a really sweet piece with beautiful original patina. This does uh, retain the original reins. Um, but you can just see at this uh, diminutive size, the details are just not quite as crisp. You know, particularly looking at the hands, looking at the figure's face. Um, you can see the, everything that you saw before, but it's just not quite as defined as it was. It's still you know, a beautiful cast and, and a much more different price point, so much more approachable. Um, in this next scene, in next slide, you'll see the, the uh, sorry, the signature is not quite as deeply incised. I think that's mostly due to the, the, just the, the size that it is. And I don't have a picture of the foundry mark, but the foundry mark is really, really tiny, and it's on the short side behind the back of the horse's hooves. This was in at four thousand to six thousand in my sale, and it brought eighty nine hundred with premium. The top price for this particular size for Dallin is fifteen thousand, and that was for a number. This was number two hundred and eighty. Um, the fifteen thousand was number two hundred and forty. Moving on to my fourth case study, it's Edward Boreen, who was an artist who worked in a variety of mediums, but we'll be able to talk about um, etchings for the first time today. He was a prolific Western artist, as I said, working in oil, watercolor, ink, gra graphite, etching. He also uh, was uh, worked in leather as well. He made uh, tooled saddles. He also um, particularly tooled leather frames that you sometimes see on his watercolors, which is super special. I've only seen two in my career and I've handled hundreds of borings. Uh, so if you see a tooled leather frame around a boring watercolor, he made it. Um, he grew up in San Leandro near Oakland, which at the time was a rural farming community. And from a young age, he wanted to do two things. He wanted to draw and he wanted to be a cowboy. So he started working at a ranch at, uh, in Oakland at about age 17. And he continued working at ranches for his later teenage years. Um, he studied for a time at the San Francisco Art School. And he also later on studied etching specifically at the Art Students League in New York under Child Hassam. So as I was indicating, Boring really kind of walked the walk of a cowboy. He talked like a cowboy, he dressed like a cowboy. His art focus on cowboy and Western subjects. Um, and he also literally worked as a cowboy for many years. And he also knew a lot of the major players in uh, Southern California and, and beyond. So he was very close friends with Maynard Dixon, uh, Charlie Russell. Uh, he was friends with the actor Will Rogers, Olaf Seltzer, um, Carl Oscar Borg. Jimmy Swinnerton was a, a mentor to him. He knew uh, Leo Carrillo. And he was a founding member of the Rancheros Vistadores, which is a Santa Barbara area. Um, a group of, of horse people who, of horse men, I think actually, um, who participate in annual rides every year. And that they did, he did all of the um, early rides and he, uh, and they continue today. After spending a few years in New York, he settled permanently in Santa Barbara in 1921. He really, I think, didn't love New York and uh, was there you know, to, to learn and, uh, but it just didn't suit his lifestyle. So he was, he settled permanently in 21 in Santa Barbara. He builds a Hopi style home that he named La Barranca in the Mesa area of Santa Barbara. Um, and he uh, had a studio there as well. Although the bulk of his work uh, is co our cowboy subjects, you'll see obviously in front of us that he also depicted Native American and Mexican communities um, that he encountered on his travels. So I'm starting with the best example here of, of a, what I think is the best example by Boreen. 
It's a great ceremonial scene, a line of um, seven Plains Indian warriors decked out from head to toe uh, with gorgeous headdresses. You can see in the center, um, one of the uh, warriors has a buffalo horn headdress as well. They're walking past some beautifully decorated teepees. And I particularly like um, in this front left that you can, he, he's even articulated the structure of the teepee leaving the door open. It's got beautiful detail, really bold and saturated color for Boreen. Um, and this one is uh, actually sold for the third highest price at auction for $106,000 when it was offered in 2015 at Bonham. And now a, not a strong cowboy subject, and certainly this is what you see more typically of his work. Um, action and narrative elements are always top with this kind of thing. Does it tell an exciting story? Um, he also is known for, because he really was a working ranch person, um, he's known for at his accuracy of an animal anatomy. And he kind of really captures the tension here with the um, position of, of the steer, the tension on the rope. And then I also love how he's handled the horse. So you know, the horse is kind of going up a small hill and also sort of counterbalancing the cowboy as he's pulling. And he, you can really get a whole a sense of that in this scene. This was part of um, a single owner sale that we had at Bonhams in 2019, the Brinkman Collection, and it sold for about $21,000 against an estimate of 10 to 15. So I think these now are all better best examples. Um, Boring tended to work on the small side, so it's not surprising to see this kind of measurements for his work. Um, on the left, you see five riders on horseback, which I think is a particularly strong example. Great subject, nice setting, well executed figures um, and that sold. Uh, also a combination of watercolor and gouache, which is a little bit rarer. That sold at Bonhams in 2017 for about $20,000. The stagecoach I put in on the upper left because stagecoach is a frequent subject in all of his different types of mediums. Um, and this one I think is a particularly nice example. They're coming toward us. There's good action. You can see all the dust kick being kicked up by the horses in their full run. And this sold in 2015 as well for $18,000 at Bonhams. And then Bucking Bronco is a really strong example of his work. This one uh, was aggressively priced um, by Old West events in 2018 at 65 to 85,000, but it still brought 76. And I think it's just because, I mean, not only, he so often isolates that Bucking Bronco figure and horse, but in this case, you have all of this great background as well. So it's just, it's a real showstopper of things. Yeah, we're getting smaller here. So um, some simpler, as you can see, the isolated Bucking Broncos in two cases. Um, these are all small works, but, but strong works for Boreen, all in the watercolor medium. Um, Bucking Bronco and Bronc Rider both sold for between five and 7,000 at auction. Um, Mesa is a, a particularly nice motif that you see over and over again, where he's putting very tiny figures in the vast landscape. And I think it's a particularly nice uh, example of this subject for Boreen. And that sold for about $5,000 in uh, this past year at Bonhams. And then the getaways got you know, the action that you're looking for as well. And that one sold at Coeur d'Alene last year for 13,000. So as I said, he worked in a variety of mediums. So moving on to some um, better examples in the ink division. Uh, so we have um, a really nice bucking horse piece that sold this past January, very strongly at Brian LaBelle's Old West auction for 18,000. I think it's a particularly um, detailed example. And, and again, you know, good movement, good action. Rough Ride Ahead uh, sold for 14,000 at Coeur d'Alene last year. And A Western Gentleman, I think is a particularly strong, um, just is kind of still portrait for the artist, very detailed. And that sold for 10,000 at Bonhams a couple of years ago. So talking about his etchings, um, and this is what I really wanted to get into in terms of um, collecting issues. So Boreen was a prolific etcher. He made at least 320 etchings. Some are etchings in dry point, some are just dry point, and he even made a few monotypes. He had some eccentric habits, however, when it came to his etchings. Firstly, he did not number them. So we do not have any addition numbers for a boring etching. Um, his practice was predominantly to print as the, they sold. So consequently, what would have been considered more popular, there are more of, and the more obscure ones there are less, less of. But we don't have any addition numbers specifically. And then often he didn't sign until they were sold. So and when he passed away somewhat suddenly, he, his wife was left with a lot of unsigned etchings. So what they proceeded to do was to mark them as estate pieces, but they still don't have a signature. And then additionally, he did not destroy his plates <laughs> and his plates are around. Collectors collect them. Most people are scrupulous. Some people are unscrupulous. <laughs> 
So what you have with all of these issues is a lack of, of real um, recording of his work in the etching medium. And so consequently, we do see um, restrikes that are presented as historic works um, because you have so many that were really periodly pulled, but they don't have a signature. So it, it really kind of, um, it, it's a, a somewhat problematic thing. And so it's particularly important to know your source when you're buying, um, not just etchings. We have seen uh, fakes in, in other mediums for Boreen as well, because you know he never, I, as far as I can tell, he never saw a scrap of paper he didn't want to put a steer on. So that a lot of those are unsigned, they're odd shapes. So it's sort of sort of easy to um, to mask some fraud in there. So just be be aware of, of your source when you're purchasing his works. Um, and obviously, you know, in the hierarchy, signed is better than unsigned. Um, and then having a remark is better than not having a remark. Uh, two of the pieces on this screen have remarks, and that is the extra sweet little tiny vignette in pencil that he would put in the lower margins. And he would usually do that quick study when he signed them for friends and for other purchasers. So in scratching high and going to town cases, they both have a nice um, horse and rider. Sometimes you see a steer remark. And so those are kind of a little added bonus that you don't always see on a signed piece. But certainly that almost guarantees they're authentic. Um, so uh, in terms of what I've chosen for etchings, these are some of my favorites for him, but particularly wanted to point out drink time. This is a really rare etching um, and it's a very different kind of subject for him. So apparently his wife had challenged him to stop making all these aggressive action filled scenes to make something a little bit more peaceful and gentle. And he's come up with the composition drink time. And you see this charming group of, I guess, burrows. I, I, we can argue about that, I'm not sure, but they're at a water trough and it's just a very, very sweet scene. This has been offered only once that I'm aware of at, at auction. And that was in a 2000 Catherine Haley sale that I, I was a part of when I was at Christie's. Um, she was a patron of the artist and had a huge collection of boring, at least 75 etchings and dozens of draw, ink drawings and watercolors. And so um, I don't know that there were many of these pulled. Uh, so that we had it at, two, at 800 to 1200 in 2000 and it brought 8200. Check your closets. If you have one of these, they're, it's super special and it would be really, really uh, desirable on the boring market. Going to um, Town and Scratching High, incidentally, both sold in the last year for about 2200, which is a typical price for his better etchings. So that's the end of my talk, really. I just wanted to end with um, just some very brief comments about the contemporary Western market. I think uh, there is so much exciting stuff happening in the contemporary Western market today. I love um, how artists are pushing uh, the envelope on what like a traditional boundary of Western art might be, you know, who's included and how things are depicted. Um, you know, cowboy artists of America are always a good bet in terms of quality. Artists like Howard Turpin that you see on the upper left, Martin Grelly, uh, Frank McCarthy, founder Joe Beeler. I love the art of um, Glenn Goodacre, which I've included here as well. Um, Bev Doolittle, Mark Maggiore, you can see on the upper right. Um, Logan uh, Maxwell Hajij, uh, they're just, the new West guys are just doing really cool stuff and there's a lot of women in there too. The prices that these artists are commanding have really gotten kind of astronomical. Um, and I think partly because of that, a lot of them are making high quality reproductions of paintings um, so they can reach a broader audience. And I just wanted to mention from a connoisseurship standpoint, when you're thinking about purchasing that, now of course I can't afford a Howard Turpening either. And if I love his work and I want it on my walls, that is a way to go. But just keeping in mind from what I said in my introduction, uh, think about it from a decorative standpoint to adorn your walls. These are not gonna be investment pieces. Uh, the depreciation would be quite significant. I was at a house recently and they had a whole pile of beautifully framed reproductions of paintings with edition sizes of like 36,000. <laughs> so think of these really as, as decoration. Um, it's just an important distinction to make when, when you're considering purchasing them. They're, they're great, but you know, it's just, they're, they're, they're not the investment that you're looking for. So in any event, I hope these case studies um, provided some good information for you. Um, my intent was to illustrate a variety of topics, um, a variety of mediums, and a variety of considerations in terms of condition, in terms of subject, um, in terms of print edition sizes. Um, so I hope that you're able to take some information away um, in terms of guidance as you continue or start your collection. And um, I just wanted to uh, put my contact and Lindsay's contact here and a huge thank you to our audience and our co-hosts um, we would love to continue this conversation on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Lindsay and I are available to talk about these artists, other artists uh, at, at your convenience. Um, but that's, uh, that's the end of my talk and I thank you for your time.
All right, thank you, Catherine. Um, we are, we've gone over just a little bit um, and that is okay. Um, thank you so much, Catherine. I know you had so much to share with us today. Um, and what I'd like to do now is give people the opportunity if they um, have questions to um, uh, turn on their microphones, you can ask those questions. Um, if you would like to use your, um, use the chat function, you are also welcome to do that. Um, and we'll give uh, people opportunity if they have questions to ask. I'll go ahead and prime the pump and ask a question. Um, Catherine, that was a great presentation. Would you talk a little bit more about um, sculpture and issues like re-strikes and different foundries? Sure, yeah, that's a really good point there. Thank you for bringing that up. So yeah, when you think about, I mean, Remington is the obvious one, right? So there are so many reproductions, um, not so many for the artists I picked, but some of the artists that are in the star collection, you see all kinds of different reproductions. So boundary mark is critical. And usually there's books like the Bronzes of the America West, the Bell's Broder book, or there's other resources that can direct you to what is, what's the, what's the right boundary mark? <laughs> Did they work with Gorham? Did they work with Roman bronze works? Did they work with Gruet in Paris? And if there's no foundry mark, that's a red flag too, because most of these artists, if they were period pieces, they were working with a foundry and that foundry would identify themselves on the cast. So yeah, that, that's critically important. Look for a foundry mark. Um, I think generally speaking, I think this is an accurate statement, correct me if I'm wrong, but if a Remington has a green marble base on it, it's gonna be a restrike. <laughs> so avoid the, I mean, again, it's, it's like I said about the print reproductions. If you like, if you, can afford a real rattlesnake and you have this fairly competently done restrike, fine, enjoy it, but it's not an investment piece and it's not an authentic, it's a posthumous restrike that's not considered his work. Thank you, Sarah, for the other question. Do we have oh, other sorry. questions? I'm sorry, Catherine. <laughs> I just, I'm just looking at the chat. Someone's asking what a restrike means. That's saying, oh, Sarah, you are. Or no, someone, someone. I think that is our director, Trina Nelson Thomas. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Trina. Um, so that would mean a recast of, so, you know, there's the lost wax boundary that the, 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 um, the artist has contracted with the boundary to make in his lifetime or, or her lifetime. And then they can take an existing cast and maybe everyone could speak better than this. They can take an existing cast and make a recast of it. They're usually a little bit smaller. So, you know, dimension is important too. If, if they are identified as 20 and a half inches high and you're looking at one that's 18 and a half inches high, that's, that's going to be an indicator of an issue too. Because you can't, it can't go from, you know, you're, you're making the, out of the same mold each time. So it can't go, become suddenly two inches smaller in, this, in the same casting process. So I, but the recast would be a, a later cast after an existing sculpture. I guess sometimes if you have the original artist cast, they can make recasts from that too. But I think more often when you're talking about like a Remington recast, they're recasting from an existing sculpture. It, correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Davidson, you're nodding, but I think that's right. Catherine, I think we have, uh, there's a question in here in the chat, but I think I just saw Gina Tigert raise her hand. Gina, did you have a question you wanted to ask? I sure did. And thank you for saying my last name correctly. That was exciting. Oh, well, I was really <laughs> hopeful I was saying it correctly. Well, thank you guys so much for putting this together. I've really enjoyed it. Um, and I did want to ask a little bit about kind of through the lens of current events, um, issues around race and maybe, you know, the difficult questions about our history as Americans. Um, are you seeing any changes in the market when it comes to maybe people who are representing indigenous people or manifest destiny with a little bit more of a skeptical lens. You know, we had people like Fritz Scholder who really kind of tackled some of those more contemporary problems. Um, and I'm wondering if you're seeing any changes in the industry about, um, you know, artists addressing those versus just something that's kind of pleasing to look at and romantic. I'm sure other people can answer along with me. I, I am definitely seeing that there's just a lot more awareness and there's a lot more conversation happening everywhere about this, this kind of topic. Um, on my, my last, the contemporary art slide, you saw that um, Mark Maggiore was challenged to diversify his works. And so that the piece I specifically chose that he donated to the Briscoe Museum depicts black cowboys, which is a really incredible history that we really were ignoring for too long. So I do think that there's, 
some really good conversation going about um, you know inclusivity and and um, and appropriate depictions and and how you know how that's changing in today's language from you know the people that I'm talking about that I was presenting today a hundred years ago. You know, some Cyrus Dallin was so progressive, but not really by our standards. You know, I mean, you can't you can't put him in 2021 and say, you know, it's it's it, he's of of his time ultimately. But I do, I do think that's a great question. And I do think there's a lot of really good conversation happening along those lines. Thank you for yeah, your I'd question. Like to... Oh, sorry, yeah. Davidson, I didn't mean to cut you off. <laughs> oh, not at all. I, I would love to chime in on that because that's Absolutely. a really good question. Um, and that's something that I often talk about when framing the Tau Society of Artists, you know, for what they were doing during their period in the context and context is everything. Um, is that what the Tau Society of Artists were doing, we often, we can view them easily now with this romantic lens of their vision of Native America, which is very easy to do with a 2021 perspective. But if we go back a hundred years, you know, this is the height of the, the BIA and forced removal of children from families. And, you know, at that point, you know, scientists were still arguing whether Native Americans were, were fully human. Um, so if you look at it in la that lens and you look at what the artists were depicting, which was the people as the primary subject, not landscape necessarily, but more focus on the people, both native and Hispano, then actually the work is pretty progressive, just taken with that context, um, which I often do point out is in stark comparison to Remington and Russell, which are largely depicting a never ending struggle for manifest destiny. Um, so yeah, those are imp important points. And yeah, I think the conversation has changed a lot and I'm seeing a next generation of collectors that are very much engaged in that conversation. Um, and I think Mark, Mark Majori is a great um, example. You know, he has, he has really embraced this concept of West of Many Colors and he's focusing on, on depicting people that are largely less portrayed or, you know, again, similar to the Tao Society of Artists, portraying them in a more humanistic, um, you know, depiction and narrative. Davison, thank you for adding to that. I appreciate it so much. Sarah Bain, do you have anything that you would like to add? I don't want to put you on spot, but I wanted to give you the opportunity in this question as we think about um, current um, contemporary Western artists and depicting these topics. Um, just, uh, well, I, one interesting um, point back to uh, Catherine's presentation um, with the Dallin sculptures, the one that was the least popular in terms of sales was the protest, which is the most um, uh, strongest statement uh, of defiance. Uh, and that is still um, the, the subject that is a little more difficult for most to um, take, uh, take as a collecting item. Um, I think within um, Western art, you know, uh, Gina Teichert brought up a shoulder um, and uh, we do see in the late 20th century and um, the, the 21st century, uh, a growing appreciation of the contributions of Native American artists. And um, shoulder is, a, is an excellent uh, example of um, an artist who um, uh, has achieved prominence and um, his, his works are often um, interpreting uh, Native American experiences from um, rather different viewpoints from the 19th century. And yet he is, I, I, I would think that the, I think the market shows he is avidly collected, um, which is, um, I, I think there is a, a support for recognizing the contributions of, of artists who are presenting different viewpoints and bringing uh, their unique voices to um, the discussion. All right, we've got a couple questions coming in from the chat, um, and I want to make sure we can get to those just because we are right at one o'clock. Thank you so much to everyone who has joined us so far and is staying here with us. Um, Catherine, we had a question from Megan specifically about um, Tenny Johnson, Frank Tenny Johnson works, I believe. Um, apparently, I think maybe there's something unique coming up in market maybe in July at Cordelline. 
Um, I think this was Megan's question specifically. She was wanting to know. Yeah. So, well, so I want to just mention Jennifer, do you, because Davidson has some stuff to say too. Should we pause questions? And yeah, if that's okay. Um, that's okay with folks. We can pause just idea. before we are kind of starting to lose people here real quick. Yeah. Um, we will, can continue this question and answer session, certainly. Um, uh, Davison, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Catherine, for that suggestion. I'll let you wrap it up. And I do, before you leave, have three quick questions for you. I'll pop up on a poll when Davison is done. Okay, so this is the wrap up now? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah. I don't want to miss it. <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you, Catherine. That was a really fun journey through um, some exceptional artists. Uh, I definitely learned a whole lot being along for the ride. So thank you for that. Um, and yeah, I, that, that brought up all sorts of questions. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to continue any question and answer if people want to stick around because it's a fun conversation and there is a lot of territory to talk about. Um, but I want to say thank you to everyone who's joined us. Uh, it's an honor to be partnering with the Stark and with Bonhams, and it's been a pleasure to get to know some of my colleagues here. And I want to encourage you to join us uh, again, August 20th, we'll be continuing this conversation with both Catherine and Lindsay Davis here. Uh, and we'll be talking about kind of a primer on, on joining the auction, uh, auction 101 from evaluation to sale to collection. So uh, I hope you'll come back and join us. Thank you, Davison. I'm gonna pop up a poll for you real quick. There are three, oh, um, it's not gonna let me pop it up because I think Trina is in on our SMA Zoom account. That is okay. Um, uh, thank you for your time. We'll just pass that one up this time. So um, now can we, I'm gonna circle us back here to Megan's question, Catherine, um, about Frank Tinney Johnson. Um, and uh, I think, like I said, I think it's a specific work. I'm just trying, I don't think you mentioned Megan, which one, but there was a unique piece coming up. So I don't know the piece that's coming up yet because last I checked their website, they only had some, a few highlights listed. Um, I purposely, I mean, I love Franklin Johnson and I've handled a number of his works, but I, you know, I purposely was uh, not choosing works that were in the Star Collection. <laughs> so he's one of them. <laughs> um, so I'd be happy to continue that conversation one-on-one. Uh, -on -one, so feel free to contact me. Thank you. Um, and I think maybe uh, perhaps you could reach out, Catherine. Um, I know you shared that contact information. So um, let's see here. Um, and then we had, I think, uh, Emily, uh, not, excuse me, Emily, Elizabeth, forgive me. I think you had a question about bronzes. I'm sorry. Um, it's okay. Let me unmute. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, me. Great. Uh, Catherine, first of all, it's wonderful to speak to you or not speak to you, but get to hear you speak in person. Um, and, and all of y'all in here, such wonderful information. I'm new and young at this. And so I'm just learning everything that I can. Um, I brought to y'all, Bonhams, the um, Barry B. Brooks collection back in uh, February 26th. It's your oh, Western. Well, it's so nice to meet you. I know you. Know yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, so my question was the hippo, you know, the one I'm talking about. Um, mm -hmm. He was, you know, he was six and a half inch. So he was a small bronze. And as you mentioned, you know, the smaller bronzes, less detail, sometimes they don't have, you know, as much saleability, but he ended up doing so well and, oh. you know, sold, what was it, 628% above the mid-estimated average. Why do you think that piece by Jonas did so well? What do you think it was about that bronze that was just so attractive? Okay, so first I want to say, like, you can get great detail in small, but, you know, the comparison I was making was that the small had less detail than the 22 inch. Okay. Um, so, and you know, it's a different sort of medium too. I mean, it's a hippo. So, you know, he wasn't wearing any clothes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the, the facial features were a little bit more generalized, but I, I mean, honestly, that was like my favorite of that collection too. I just don't think you get to see hippos a lot in bronze. Uh -huh. It was really charming. And, um, and yeah, I think that it was, just one of those things where our, the price of conservative, you know, with auctions, so going in conservatively with an estimate often does yield a lot of action in the sale room. And we had a number of different bidders on that. We had a lot of people calling about it. So I think it was just a combination, even in this case, maybe even more than the artist, it was just the subject was kind of irresistible and the price point was quite approachable. Okay. So it was a re really nice combination in that regard. But I think it had beautiful detail and you can get really detail in the small scale. Just in my specific comparison of the two appeals, you could see a very distinct um, kind of downgrade in the de detailing of the eight, eight and three quarter versus the 22. Uh-huh, okay, great. 
Thank you. And thank you all for all your wonderful work and for letting thank me join. So nice to talk to you. Thank you too as well. Hey, Elizabeth. Um, I have another question in our chat, Catherine, um, and I think Sarah and Davison, but I'd be curious to hear from you as well on this. Um, Karen Leonard has asked, um, and I think this goes back to the, um, maybe Gina's question, will this modern perspective make older works mentioned in less demand and therefore devalue their work in terms of dollars in the near future? I, I would defer to, what, to my colleagues here. I, mean, I don't think so. I think that there's so much history there, collecting history and interest in the, in the historical artists. Um, I think it's just a continuing conversation uh, and there's room for both in, in that realm as well. I think. So I don't, I don't anticipate any significant devaluing. And I, just, just to bring up another question, someone's asking about, Megan's asking about the good, really strong results at Scottsdale. Mm -hmm. The Western market's really strong. So we had a great sale in February. Um, other other uh, competitors of ours have had good sales since then, including Scottsdale this past weekend. So I do I do think we've had significant recovery in terms of general American markets, and particularly comparing like the California impressionism market. The Western market is much broader. We're talking about a lot of different states. There's a you know and, and additionally, um, I think from a auction perspective, you know perhaps you live in Manhattan, but you have a home in Colorado Springs as well. So, you know, you might be collecting American modernism for that home, but you want your Western American pieces for your secondary home. So it, there is just a much broader market than you'd have, say, in the California market. So, yeah. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that assessment. I don't, I don't think, you know, issues of social justice are going to adversely affect um, great art. I, I don't see that entering into the marketplace. I think it's going to enter into our conversation. I think it's going to enter into exhibitions and research and scholarship and how we frame that conversation. I, I hope that happens. I think we're, we've been seeing that happening for a long time in the museum community. Um, and I think certainly it's going to be spurred on even more. Um, but I think that's where we're going to see that conversation expand. And I think we're going to see it reflected in more contemporary artists as they approach certainly the historic West. Um, I would like to see that continue. And I think we are seeing that there is, again, there's a, yeah, as Catherine mentioned, there's a great gen next generation of, of Western artists that are doing really compelling work. Um, and they're really great folks. And I'm enjoying getting to know all them. Um, and uh, I encourage you to get out there and go to auctions and, uh, and meet the artists and go to museum openings and exhibitions um, and get to know some of them because there's some really great folks. Sarah, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Um, I'll just sort of echo that. Um, I'm not the person to talk about values, but I think in terms of, of context, um, you know, the, it is a situation where we're enlarging the tent and we're looking at um, artists in a new way. Um, um, so we're perhaps reviving the careers of some artists who've been overlooked um, and that gives us an opportunity. It, it may mean that we put less emphasis in, in museum exhibits and displays on uh, some of the traditional artists, but um, they're always going to, to hold a place in the history of um, the nation and, and the history of um, American art. Um, so Remington, Russell, the classics, I think will always um, be an important part of our, our story, but we'll, we are finding larger and more diverse stories to tell. Nice. Do we have any other questions? I think the last question I saw in the chat was the question on Scottsdale, and I think you got to that one, Catherine. Um, I think we are finished. Guys, thank you so much for being here with us today. I'm gonna to try this poll one more time. My director just texted me and told me she got off the account. I think I might be able to send that. It still is not gonna let me do it. Technical difficulties, hang in there with us. It's always a learning experience, right? Um, thank you for being here with us today. We really appreciate you. Um, I wanna just quickly say we've got uh, colleagues from across the field here as well. And we're so glad that you were able to join us. Um, Catherine, what an incredible presentation. Davison, it's been a pleasure partnering. And Lindsay, thank you for working with us to get this organized. Um, as Davison said, I hope you'll make plans to join us again in August. Um, if you were on our list, we'll be sure to invite you 
to that uh, program. And um, if you have questions, all of our contact information is available where you saw these um, uh, programs publicized um, and we would be happy to chat with you and just have a great um, afternoon and thank you for being here.